what's being filmed? Yes. Oh, okay. So, um, so I'm going to talk about reasoning and uh, with a twist, right? There, there's a project that I'm involved in uh, back at Cornell. I'm working with uh, someone in the law school, Professor Robert Summers, who is a uh, kind of the leading American uh, theorist on contract law. And he's kind of moved into jurisprudence as, as kind of an interest of his. And so um, he's writing a book on reasons and reasoning. And even though the book is specific to legal reasoning, the principles are much broader than that. And next semester I'm going to be uh, working closer with him as a research assistant on trying to develop some of the ideas in this book. So a lot of these ideas obviously originate with Professor Summers, and I want to make sure that due attribution is made. Uh, I have a draft of a paper that I've been evaluating with him and would love to present to you guys and get some feedback as well. So uh, the project here is to really come up with and think about reasoning in terms of uh, creating a taxonomy of the different kinds of reasons and really evaluating and looking at you know, what makes a good reason and you know, what kinds of different reasons are there. And he's specifically interested in, um, and this is why I think it's really appropriate for our purposes, non-authority related reasons. Right? So in the law, uh, much of the law is just following a precedent. Right? So it's like you have a case, the precedent, the Court of Appeals has said X, and the lower court has no discretion. They must apply the reasoning of the prior precedential case. So that's not as interesting to us. What's interesting is in situations where the courts are oh, doing something that is uh, an issue of first impression, uh, undecided case, having to weigh conflicting reasons, and so we're looking at all of the non uh, authority oriented reasons. But it's important to understand that there are authority based reasons, right? The Ten Commandments are the definitive authority based reasons. I mean, that the reason is these are commandments from God. You don't get much more reasoning beyond that. But when you start to look at uh, non authority based reasonings, the first thing uh, that you want to do is you want to look at the type of conclusion that is being asserted. And so I'm going to start out with the taxonomy. Uh, that we've developed, and if anybody can think of others, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to do. So we have here 13 different kinds of conclusions and the way that they relate to reasoning. So the first one is the conclusion is that the projected content of a proposed new law conforms to or embodies an acceptable, accepted and justifiable moral principle or idea. This conformity to or embodiment of such a moral principle or idea is a reason supporting the conclusion that without more, such a proposed law ought to be adopted. So the idea is, is that does the motion right, or proposal or model conform to or embody an accepted and justified moral principle? Right? So you could say uh, we have, for instance, um, you know, in, a, in a, um, a situation where you're debating you know, whether or not you should use somebody as a means to an end uh, that, that's improper and it conforms to you know, kind of a Kantian deontological idea that you don't use people as means to an end. And so if the policy conforms to that idea, that would be a reason for accepting the conclusion or the policy or the proposal. So the second is that the conclusion is that the policy statement at hand is an accurate formulation of an already existing or accepted policy. So you have a policy that is out there. For instance, we don't negotiate with terrorists. That is an accepted policy. And you have a new proposal. You know, should we talk to Ahmadinejad? Should we talk to North Korea? Well, the, the reason would be no because we don't negotiate with terrorists. So assuming that you are assuming the policy is already accepted, and of course that can be contested, that would be a reason for adopting the policy or conclusion. The third is that the conclusion is that a proposed policy is of such a quality that it ought to be adopted as an accepted policy in our system to resolve such issues, right? So you have a qualitatively good new proposal. So this is contrasted with 
conforms to a moral reason, contrasted to, you know, different from conforms to an already existing and accepted policy. Now it's just when you evaluate the proposal on its own merits, it is such of good quality, it's qualitatively good, that it's, it's, it ought to be adopted. Uh, number four would be that the conclusion is that the accepted policy at hand or proposed policy that ought to also be adopted uh, is as an accepted policy in our system is applicable to resolve the issue at hand. So this is the idea of applicability, a decision rule. And if so, then this is a reason supporting resolution of the issue. The next one is the conclusion is that the projected or actual result accords with customary practice. Right? So again, just like you have follows uh, an accepted moral principle or follows an accepted uh, policy or is so qualitatively good that it should be adopted on its own merits, this is that it conforms to custom and tradition. So you can see the distinctions, right? You can see these are all different ways or reasons that you can give for a policy. Conforms with tradition, conforms with already accepted policy, conforms with accepted morality. The next one is the conclusion is that the projected result here accords with a legitimate personal choice or preference of a party. This accordance and this legitimacy are reasons for supporting the conclusion. And there are two aspects here, accords with and legitimate personal choice. So this is the idea that the, the policy should be left to the individual preference, right? This is, this is the idea of like vanilla or chocolate ice cream. It's, it's, it accords with a choice. Uh, the next one is that the conclusion is that having institution A rather than institution B resolve this type of issue is more appropriate. This comparative institutional appropriateness is itself a reason to so conclude. So if you're weighing whether the courts are better equipped to deal with something than the legislature and you conclude that the courts are better, then that becomes a reason right, for adopting a particular institutional approach to a policy. Uh, the conclusion is that the proposed rule or other law X would be in practical terms more duly administratable than would proposed rule or other law or policy Y. So again, a, an independent reason is administration, ease of administration. Is it vague? Is there a bright line? Can you implement or administrate the policy? Again, so these are all different reasons, right? As you start thinking about this, you can say, wow, there's lots of different arguments I can generate from, from why a policy may be good or it may be bad. It's good because it conforms with existing moral ideas. It's good because it conforms with existing policy ideas. It's good because it's appropriate for the type of institution. It's good because it conforms with traditions. It's good because, you know, all of these different reasons, because uh, it's administratable. The conclusion is that the evidence is duly supportive of the adjudicative factual conclusion and this itself is a reason supporting the conclusion. So this is the idea of evidence, right? This would just simply be in kind of the classic Toulmin model, your idea of, of a data or a warrant, right, or a backing, right? There's fine distinctions that a Toulmin makes, but the idea is, is, that, is that the reason is evidence. It's evidence of the conclusion. And this is inductive reasoning. A lot of times you rely on, on coming to conclusions from evidence. Um, next one we have here. Is the conclusion is that the evidence is duly supportive of the legislative factual conclusion and is thus itself a reason supporting the conclusion. And here he's simply drawing a distinction. Summers is drawing a distinction between so-called legal facts and so-called legislative facts. The kind of facts that uh, courts consider and the kind of evidence and data that courts consider is very different than the kind of evidence and data that a legislature might consider. Uh, and then we have the conclusion is that the comparative weight of the two conflicting reasons or the due priority of one reason favors resolution of one over another. So this is simply like a cost-benefit right, type weighing. This is a comparative. So the conclusion is, is we outweigh. Right? Like I know one of the other lectures is mine is bigger than yours, right? So this would be an example of that type of reasoning process, that my impacts are larger, that I have more significance, and therefore that is a reason for adopting my conclusion, my model, my proposal, or whatnot. It's bigger, it has more impact, it's comparatively better. 
different than qualitatively good in its own right, different than conforms to accepting moral standards or tradition or existing policy standards or the appropriateness of the type of institution to resolve the dispute. And, um, oh, so that's it. So I guess there's 11 of them. How many are there? 11 of them? He, yeah, because number 13 is C for another possible major type of conclusion, and number 14 is other. And I think number two is actually duplicative of number one. So I skipped over it. So there's 11, but now is, can anyone else think of additional reasons like along this line? Um, it's not a particularly good reason, but it's one that gets used a lot, and it's that the proposal or policy comes from a level of purity, either in the motivation of like the person advocating it, and sometimes we say, and it's also a, a reason to not prefer it, in that if we see that, that the reasons or motivations are impure, then regardless of you know, of what those motivations are, their purity may be a reason for us to prefer it or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting, okay, that's, so one argument is, is that the same as is it's qualitatively good in its own right? I don't know, that's interesting. What do you mean by purity? But is this like assessing the motivation of, yeah. for why we're doing that it? somebody, that we may do something just because the person who advocated, who advocates it, um, motivations are pure. Okay. So good intentions. Yeah. Okay, that's even even if, even if we don't agree with what those intentions are. And oftentimes we can say, even if somebody like has, you know, like a good idea, we say, oh, well, they're not pure in their motivations, and therefore we reject it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it works both ways. Yeah, I like that. I think that is, that's a potential, yeah, that there's an interesting one to add there. And then I'm interested in procedural justice. I have a very unique, particular interest in procedural justice. So one of the ones I'm thinking about is 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 the fact that it is is the fact that an outcome comes from a fair procedure in and of itself warrant the legitimacy of the outcome, right? So you have Rawls, for instance, proposing the difference principle as a result of his procedure of hypothesizing ourselves behind the veil of ignorance. And because if we assume that's a fair procedure, then we can have some confidence that, that that's a reason to assume that the conclusion is valid or legitimate and therefore that the difference principle uh, is a good policy. So, um, you know, it's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. It's kind of like it's kind of like your purity example, except it's more procedural. It's that if you filter something through a good procedure, if you have a fair judge in a fair court, you know you're going to get a good result, regardless of its substantive outcome, because it came through a fair procedure. And that was the kind of one I wanted to add to this in addition. So now we're back to 13, I guess. So then you look at, can we catalog, well, like, so then, then there's kinds of reasons. Okay, so um, we're going to go into kinds of reasons, and I think we have eight kinds of reasons. So we have morality-oriented reasons, of course. And then we have public policy-oriented reasons. And then there's practical or administration-oriented reasons. So these kind of you know, correspond to what we were just saying. But this is more of a uh, less, less stated in terms of uh, the C as the R. Institutional suitability-oriented reasons. Uh, custom oriented reasons and then the question becomes like are there are there subsets like do you think there would be subsets to a custom oriented reason like do you think religious customs might be different than political traditions and customs or what kind of lines can be drawn there right because I, I, I mean not all customs are necessarily the same but in trying to develop a taxonomy of reasons you want to think about some of those issues um, and then personal choice or personal preference oriented reasons uh, evidentiary oriented reasons. And then we get into a unique area of reasoning, reasoning by analogy. And this is like one of the big holdups <clears throat> that we're having in our paper is because reason by analogy is used very much in the law, but it's regarded as uh, by, you know, by uh, logicians as not being a valid form of, of, of logic, right? There's an invalidity to it because uh, you, get to pay, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to know whether an analogy is appropriate without just intuiting that the analogy is appropriate, right? If I want to compare, you know, a red apple to a red ball on the basis that they're both red, you know, there's a similarity there, but if, um, you know, if playing tennis is what you want to do, then obviously an apple is not a good thing to play tennis with. And you can say, but it's like the ball, you know, assuming you play tennis with a red ball. Well, I can come up with a better example, like a, 
a yellow ball and a banana and be like, well, they're both yellow, and I can play tennis with this yellow object, so why can't I play tennis with the banana, right? You're calling on the similarity, yeah. But I would say that the problem here is that an analogy is only good <clears throat> when you compare it with the problem. I don't know the English word right now, but the not property it has, no, it's, oh, for crying's sake. Things look, things are brown, things are round. Quality? Yeah, with the quality you need. I mean, if, if you compare, if you draw an analogy for playing tennis, the ball is yellow, the banana is yellow. Right. The quality of the object being yellow doesn't help you in any way in playing tennis. Right. For you to be able to play tennis, you need another quality of the object, and that is that it is able to bounce or whatever it is. So a ball can bounce, but a banana can't. Right. So in but, this way, uh, you uh, basketball can analysis. bounce, and it would not be a good thing to play tennis with. But then again, you just add another quality you need. Right. And how do you know what qualities? That's the idea. The that's the relevance of the of the right. That's the relevance of the target relative to the source or the or the comparative. And the question is, there's no objective way to determine what are the relevant qualities of an analogy other than intuition. And once you get into the world of intuition, that's where you know the, the strict formalists and logicians start saying that's why they believe that form of, of reasoning is invalid. Yeah. yeah, I think the other thing is that something may possess all the qualities that are necessary to happen and yet still have another quality that disqualifies it. Like, this is a horrible example, mm -hmm. but let's say footballs and puppies. Both are brown, both, you know, bounce and you can pass them. Um, and so you hypothetically could play football with a puppy, but the there's... Skin. Yeah, <laughs> but, but there's another quality that somehow makes it, like a quality of a football that's necessary to play football isn't that it's an inanimate. We wouldn't say that that's a quality that's necessary, but the presence of the opposite makes the other similar qualities less relevant. So a disqualify, that's, yeah, yeah a disqualifying condition. That's, that's and, and that's still, that too relies on intuition. It does, right. And therefore it comes out of the realm of kind of pure reason, right? From the pure sense of, of deduction and induction. So um, there's a, a lawyer named Lloyd Weinrub who wrote a book on analogical reasoning. And he posits that there are the, essentially three steps to making an analogy. So the first step is abduction. Does anyone know what abduction means? See, I didn't know that word either. I thought it was, I was like, I knew about induction and I knew about deduction, but I didn't know about abduction. So abduction, so deduction says if the premises are accepted, then the conclusion is definitely true. Okay. In induction or inference reason says if the premises are accepted, then the conclusion is probably true. Okay. Abduction says if the premises are accepted, the conclusion is possible. It's possibly true. So, for instance, scientists using the scientific method generate a theory from intuitive abduction. Obviously, you can't just go test every conceivable hypothesis in the world. You need to have a reasonable hypothesis to start. And the reasonability of that hypothesis is intuitive based on your knowledge in the field. Right? So if I'm trying, you know, if people that are psych, you know, have an in-depth knowledge of psychology are going to be much better at intuiting a hypothesis as to why, for instance, you know, people in the Milgram experiment might obey authority to all the way up to the very, very high degree. And you know somebody you know else could say, well, that's because everybody was German. Right? That was the original hypothesis, for instance, that Milgram wanted to test. He wanted to test that that Germans were more obedient to authority than Americans. This is post World War II, and how could the Holocaust happen? And and it must be that Germans are more obedient to authority. So in an effort to get a baseline rate, in order to start his experiment, he's like, well, let's just see what the level of obedience is. So I don't, is everyone familiar with the Milgram experiment, most people? So he had people administering, like saying you're gonna do a memory test and uh, you know word association game. So if I say cat, house, dog, grass, and then you could look at your list and then if you get one wrong, you're supposed to administer an electric shock, punishment. You wanna see what the effect of electric shocks or punishment is in teaching. And he had 
shocks going up from you know minor shocks on the scale and then scale and getting higher and higher and higher and the last dials were just marked with red X's XXX and he had a confederate in the back of the room and they're you know the people are administering the shocks and the confederate is trained to start screaming out in agonizing pain and then it's like pounding on the wall stop the experiment stop the experiment and the experimenter is standing there and is just saying the experiment must continue and a vast majority of the people, like two thirds or more of the people, went all the way up to the very top and delivered, you know, death level electric shocks, right? And the funny thing in the experiment is, is after, like, as you're in the middle, that screaming is at the intense, right? Most intense period. And then there's just silence. So you actually think like you might have killed the guy. And you, he videotaped this and you see people and they're sweating and they're like looking at the experimenter and they're like, go check on, you know, and no one, the experimenter's just, the experiment must go on. And so then all of a sudden Milgram was no longer interested in comparing when he found out that most Americans went all the way up the scale. It just became like, well, gee, why does that happen? So his original hypothesis was no longer the subject of his inquiry. And then it became, why do people obey authority like that? And he started running a bunch of variations and found, for instance, that if the experimenter wore a white lab coat, compliance with their demands was, was much more likely than if the experimenter didn't wear a white lab coat. And if the, if the subject was in view, there were differences. And if you had to actually administer the shock by taking like a wire and putting it on the person, that like, then people wouldn't comply. So all these factors about obedience to authority, you know, were, were studied by Milgram extensively. So you look at something like that and you're abducing a hypothesis. So if I come out and my lawn is all wet, Right? I could infer that it rained the prior evening, but or I could infer that somebody came out with a hose and watered the grass, or I could infer that children had a water balloon fight right, on my lawn. So which of those is the most reasonable? Well, it depends. I mean, obviously, if I knew there were children that like to have water balloon fights that live next door, that's going to be more possible. But the abduction is, is that, that it's possible one of those things happened. If the lawn was dry, then none of those things could happen. So I think this is almost like your, your disqualifying or negative condition, right? So, so abduction says if the premises are true, then the, then the, then the outcome is, is possible. So what Weinreb says is the first stage in developing an analogy is we abduce the analogy warranting rule, right? We hypothesize the relationships that we think might make the analogy a good one. Oh, this is red, this is red, you know, or this is, you know, let's go play tennis with them, right? And, and is redness one of the qualities that allows us to infer the conclusion that this would also be a good item to play tennis with? So you abduce the, uh, the analogy warranting rule. Then you confirm or disconfirm the analogy warranting rule through a process of induction. Right? So then this is like in the law, you start thinking of all the test cases. So if I wanted to develop you know, a rule of law that determines, like let's use search and seizure as an example. So the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. So you have your prototypical easy case, right? When the police come barging through the door without a warrant and go rifling through your desk. That's the prototypical case. Now, then the question becomes, right, uh, if I use a listening device to eavesdrop on your telephone conversation in a telephone booth, is that an illegal search or seizure? And you start determining whether, right, whether or not, so that let's, let's so, so, and we also know, for instance, that if police just go searching through garbage, that that's a permissible search, because there's no expectation of privacy, it's no longer in your home, so if I throw the murder weapon in the garbage and the police fish it out of the dumpster, they don't need a warrant to do that. They've found the murder weapon in, right, and so the courts say, well, the dumpster's in the public, and the desk is in the house. And there's an intrusion into the house, but no intrusion into the dumpster. So now you think about the telephone booth example. And it's like, well, you're kind of out of the public, but you're in a closed telephone booth. There's no intrusion through using a listening device, no physical breaking, no physical entry. So is the telephone booth example of eavesdropping in the telephone booth more like barging in and reading someone's papers out of their desk, or is it more like fishing a gun out of the dumpster? And you can ask, you know, what, what qualities are more important, the privacy quality, right? So what if it wasn't, what if you were in a telephone booth and the door was open, right? But you were out of earshot, but they had an amplifying device. And so these are all the distinctions that you make in the law. And so you, you think about, you know, what is the rule? So we might have deuce, well, the important rule is privacy. 
okay, and listen, a telephone booth is in public, and so therefore you would that would not be a search if the rule is privacy, right, or intrusion. And so you confirm or disconfirm your, your analogy warranting rule through looking at a variety of cases and assuming that you have, a, just like in the process of any inductive reasoning, assuming that you have a sufficient number of examples that are of the sufficient quality, then you can reasonably infer from that. And then you apply the analogy. And that's a deductive process. So Weinreb says that the process of ana analogical reasoning is abduction to induction to deduction. And of course, because at its core it depends on abduction, this is where people you know, um, criticize analogical reasoning. And Weinreb's response to that is yes, but that's just to generate. It's just like a creativity device, right, to generate the possible analogy warranting rule that the actual confirmation of whether the analogy warning rule is good or bad and its application rely on traditional induction and deduction. Therefore, analogy is a valid form of reasoning. I've heard a lot of like not so hot analogies in many of the debates that, that I've been listening to. I think it's hard to come up with good analogies sometimes. I don't know, what is your experience with the analogical reasoning? Do you, do, like, is there anyone, do you use a lot of analogical reasoning? I, I only use it to disqualify things. Mm -hmm. So you can, it works really poorly if you say, we allow this here, this is similar, therefore we should allow it here. When you're using it to prove that we should do something, it works poorly, but if you say, we would never accept this in Y case, like for instance with, uh, let's say, sm um, making smokers pay for their own medicine, we would never accept that uh, like someone who gets into a car accident should have driven a safer car. Um, and in this way, you're not using, and it's very different than sort of the, like when you're making an affirmative action versus when you're disqualifying something. I think analogies work a lot better to, dis to disqualify, to prove that something should never happen mm -hmm. than to prove that something should. That's interesting. Why do you think that might be the case? Because it only takes one thing to disqualify something. It only takes one quality. But like we said with the tennis ball, it takes multiple qualities to affirm something. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, yeah, and that there's less connections to make. I agree, but I think what's important when considering analogies, or what I find interesting, is something called the Vedantic Theory of Perception. I don't know if you've heard about it. No. It basically states that human beings perceive things. Mm -hmm. If I hold this paper up, everyone in this room will say it's a piece of paper. But if we put it under a microscope, we'll see that it's actually wood. So the theory says that in general people need seven things in order to seven seven things that seven qualities to recognize something as being an object of X. Now that depends on the point. Are of they theory. are they are they seven specified qualities or no, more no, just no, no, like no. seven you just points have to find of seven connection? Things. It's wide, it's got stripes on it, it's thin, it looks like a square, it makes this sound. And you and Why you seven? Why not eight? Or the six. guys, I, I don't know. I mean, I can check it out. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, no, I mean I'm sure they have a reason, but I never check, check into it because the number really doesn't matter. Okay. It's, it's the idea that you need a certain amount of qualities which you recognize so that you name something a thing, mm -hmm. X. So when you're drawing analogy, I think, analogies, I think the same happens. It's just that you don't necessarily find the seven thing the seven qualities, but you find less. Right. And on the basis of that, you kind of make them the same thing, but not completely. So I think this Vedantic theory of perception could have some explanatory yeah, power that's interesting. when considering analogies. But I never looked into it that way. It's just an idea. No, that is an interesting idea. That might have an idea. Anyone else have thoughts on analogies, reasoning by analogies, just from anyone hear a particularly good analogy or a particularly bad analogy in any of your rounds? I'm the orange juice. I thought that was a horrible analogy. I had a good analogy with the fact Sweet, like whether orange juice was sweet. Every good analogy that I made, it's, like he said, it's connected with the, with the negation rather than confirmation, something like, we should, uh, we should do it because it's a medical procedure, mm -hmm. so all medical and medical procedures are good, they're scientific, then you can say, wow, we, we, we should do an lobotomy to the guys with epilepsy because it's a medical procedure. Mm -hmm. And it's ought to be good, and that be, be just because the consequences that you are practically a plan is nothing, but it's good because it's medi medical procedure. Right. So when you draw that analogy, yeah, but in the negation. 
But maybe an interesting thing to consider would be that analogy is something that happens before we discover causation. Because w when, we, when we consider analogies, when we consider the similarities of things, we try to find the cause of something doing something. When mm -hmm. we consider a tennis ball with which we can play tennis, what is the cause of it? Maybe it's the fact that it's green or yellow or red. So we draw an analogy with a banana. So we try it out, this is not the cause. But I think that when we strip down all of the qualities that are irrelevant for the analogy to work, I think there is a point that you get to causation, mm -hmm. to causality. Interesting. Because if I strip, strip each and every quality of a tennis ball, it being green, it being fluffy to a certain extent, it being made out of whatever it's made out of, mm -hmm. and simply find the fact that it bounces in the perfect way, that its coefficient <coughs> of bouncing is 0 0.6 or whatever, then I practically get to causality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think there's another way to draw analogy, but not as uh, object to object, but to a class of object and how they're treated. For example, in the in classic debate about uh, ban or not to ban, or give rights or not to give rights. So, if you think of the word protection, so in in the case of most law, there's age limit protection based on chronology time, right? So most young people are not uh, are not allowed to have. Uh, sex before a certain age, they're not allowed to drink, they're not allowed to smoke, they're not allowed to drive. So you can see that these are the class of law that are applied for protection of, the, the, of these people who are not of a uh, consent giving adult age and those who are above it. So if you, if you have a debate where you need to decide on this thing, it's very easy to say that there are this class of law that are at the same application who has been applied to for one purpose, so the purpose of protection, and then this other class that they are not. So you can easily draw the distinction between those things by by not. You don't have to draw the whole analogy. You just have to have to mention that we don't do this. This is for this thing because straight away you click. It's just like showing the paper to you. You, you remind people that these are this law, and what you're applying to for this case will be about similar law. Mm -hmm. So I thought that is the best way to do analogy. I I don't like analogy that are. Uh, that you spin on the moment because you, when you think about an analogy on the spot like blue, yellow, and orange, you tend to be flawed and because it, you only have a few seconds to think about it. Mm -hmm. And all, the reason why you you are <coughs> coming up with an analogy of your own so called original analogy is because you are grasping at straws, you're thinking for a right. better way to do an analogy is do analogy that really happen that are used constantly by debaters or you constantly in the real world, which people already understand. So the analogy acts as a kind of reminder to the judge and to everybody else that you're drawing an analogy that are, which is already established, not a unique one, which you come up hypothetically using induction on the spot, which more often than not ruin your analogy. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's what I found. I found that almost every analogy that people have just tried to like come up with on the spot in, in the rounds I've seen has, has failed. It's been just a non-persuasive analogy. And um, it was kind of disappointing to me because I, as a lawyer, I like analogical reasoning, right? I'm used to analogical reasoning. Like, you know, the classic example Jerry Spence used was if the lion gets away, Kerr McGee must pay. And he'd explain to the jury the concept of strict liability and how it developed in the, in the common law, which is when the circus, right, would come to town and they would bring their lion, right, for the lion tamer. If the lion escaped from the cage and killed somebody in the town, then the circus would be strictly liable because they brought the dangerous object into town. And then the idea was so a lot of analogies were made. So if it's a dangerous object, so now if you know Kerr McGee ran a nuclear power plant and if there was a nuclear accident, they're strictly liable because a nuclear power plant is like a lion. But how is a nuclear power plant like a lion? Well, they're both dangerous objects brought into the town. So so Jerry, and you know, so that's what Jerry's lion gets away, Kerr McGee must pay. And the lion got away, and that was in the Silkwood case. Yeah. I think it's that if you use the if you start with a principle like um, bringing in dangerous like elements is wrong and then find an analogy to support it rather like to illustrate it rather than using your analogy to prove why that principle should exist in the first place is more effective like when yeah. we use like, yeah. yeah 
And that's the confirmation or disconfirmation process, right? That wine rep says the second step of the analogy warning rule is to, to confirm or disconfirm the analogy before applying it in a deductive sense. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, that's, so that's reasoning by analogy. So we've discussed that. So uh, the last thing I really wanted to, to touch on a little bit is something that I, I also have found interesting. And this is this book by T. Edward Gamer called Attacking Faulty Reasoning. And in this book, uh, he endeavors to come up with a theory of fallacy. And because he says, you know, we all know about the lists of fallacies that we've all been taught a million times, right? And, and, but no one's tried to come up with a comprehensive theory of fallacy and why certain fallacies work. And so he has his list in here of like 60 fallacies, and he's grouped them into four categories. And so his theory of fallacy is, and we can kind of discuss this because I'm interested to see what people think of the theory. So his, his, his theory is, is that there are four criteria to a good argument, okay? So any good argument must be relevant, any good argument must be acceptable to the people that are having the discussion, uh, any good argument must be sufficient, especially in the case of induction, and should contain at least some effort to rebut objections before the objections are made. Okay, so that would be what, um, you know, in, 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 in the Toulmin model, that's the, the but, right? I forget what he calls it. What's the, the Toulmin, the but, but for? Anyway, um, I don't like the Toulmin model. It's like my mission in life is to like, do, come up with a better model of argumentation than the Toulmin model. Um, so his theory is, is that there's fallacies of irrelevance, right? So this would be appeals to irrelevant or questionable authority, appeals to common opinion or the bandwagon effect, uh, you know, your, your genetic fallacy, um, appeals to pity, appeals to force, appeal, all the emotional appeals, appeals to tradition, appeals to personal circumstances, use of flattery, guilt by association, right? Obama hung out with Bill Ayers, therefore don't vote for him, right? So these are fallacies of irrelevance. Then there are the fallacies of unacceptability. And he has for it, so this would be you're begging the question fallacies, you're arguing in a circle, uh, the fallacy of the continuum, right? That's the fallacy of the beard, that how many whiskers does it take, right? Is everyone familiar with that fallacy? Right, so you say if 100 degrees, you know, uh, like a one degree difference is not significant. So if 100 degrees is hot, 99 degrees is also hot, and 98 degrees is also hot, and 97 degrees is also hot. You run it all the way down and then all of a sudden you have zero degrees is hot. Right, because one degree is a minor significance. So that's kind of the fallacy of the, one of my favorite, the fallacy of the continuum, right? The fallacy of division, fallacy of composition. These are all fallacies of unacceptability. They violate the acceptability criterion of good argument. Uh, then there's insufficiency, right? So you have your causation fallacies, your post hoc ergo proctor hoc, and your confusion of cause and effect, and the confusion of necessary with sufficient conditions, and the, the, the gambler's fallacy. That's a classic one. So, you know, the gambler's fallacy is like, I'm on a winning streak. I got three, you know, I threw craps three times in a row. So now I'm, you know, due to, you know, not throw craps, right? But ignoring that, that the independent event has nothing to do with the prior events. Uh -oh. You're probably no. going to disagree with that one. No, I know no, you're no. going to throw some new agey, like, no, universe is connected, like, yes, no, it does have that, an effect on me. No, it's just that in quantum physics, what we see is that... I knew you were going to go to quantum physics. No, but the gambler's <laughs> fallacy is actually at work, because what, what happens, and I am simplifying a bit right now, is that if something has happened in a certain way, if a collapse of a wave function has happened at a certain point, the probability of it collapsing in the same point the next time is actually greater than it collapsing in any So they're not truly independent. Okay, see, that is interesting. But I mean, at the quantum level, reality doesn't exist. I mean, that, yeah. well, like, they, they just, they just <laughs> prove that. That's not true. Well, they just prove that either, either like, locality doesn't matter or reality doesn't exist. And so both of those are kind of... And no, so, but that, that's just a fault you prove. I don't know enough about quantum physics okay. to settle this one, but I'm, I'm shocked that the quantum physics shows that the behavior of molecules or photons or whatever behave differently if observed than not observed. Like, how do they know they're being observed? They don't have cognitive, right? So it's just, you know, okay, I think it's that's... Not, I, I think the problem here is they behave and they, if they know they are observed or not, it's not that they behave. Maybe it's the way we make them to behave. 
Right. I think I think what we have to change in our viewpoint of the world is that we create it every day. It's not just the push pull mechanism of influencing the world, but it's just the being there taking a judgment. Yeah, it's a, see, this is this, there's a lot of interesting kind of ontological and epistemological questions that are bound up in what we're learning about quantum physics because a lot of what we think about in terms of reasoning and logic and stuff is based on a view of the world, right? Like a very Humean view of the world. And I was just talking with Riddy in the other day, he's reading this book called The Black Swan, right? And the guy uses the turkey example. And it's like the turkey thinks that they're being taken care of and the nice human comes out and feeds them every day, every day, every day, every day, until today, all of a sudden they're all excited. They're like, oh, I'm gonna get fed. And it's like, surprise, you know. It's, and it's like, so the fact that the turkey was consistently fed every single day for a thousand days, as you know, his life is not at all predictive of what Thanksgiving day is gonna bring. So, uh, you know, and you see the same thing in an economic crash. And so this is just the idea of whether the past can ever predict the future. Because we, we have these assumptions of causation based on our, our view of the world that, you know, is not understood at the quantum level. And as we understand more at the quantum level, it's going to, I think, affect our views of causation, which will ultimately affect our views of reasoning, ultimately, because we have a you know, very uh, positivistic view of, of kind of reasoning. So, and then the final fallacies, and it, is, it was the ones he calls the fallacies of ineffective rebuttal. So, like, he puts the ad hominem fallacy over here. I would put the ad hominem fallacy in fallacies of irrelevance. And so, I think his, his theory breaks down a little bit. Like, it's hard when you try to come up with something and pigeonhole everything, because some of the things get forced fits. But I do like the idea that the four criteria of argument, right? I think that's a good way to think about an argument. Is it relevant? Is it sufficient? And is it based on, you know, kind of acceptable premises that we accept in the course of it, and then does it have built-in rebuttal or not is, is more like, you know, I don't think a good argument requires an assumed rebuttal. I think if it meets the three criteria of relevance, sufficiency, and acceptability, it's a sound argument. But I do like the what, idea of trying to see how the fallacies kind of fit in to violating one of those criteria of good argument. Um, I think that's an interesting theoretical approach, you know, kind of weaning my way through this book, um, and he just gives tons and tons and tons of examples, right? So he's asking me to make an inductive conclusion that his theory is good based on all his examples. So I'm trying to come up with some counter examples. So where, where would the sunken costs fallacy fall into? The which fallacy? Sunken costs. Second costs. What's sunken that? costs. Oh, sunken costs. Um, I think he'd put that in with the gambler's fallacy and the right and the uh, the, the fallacy of sufficiency. Yeah, it would be a fallacy of insufficiency. Um, so I think we, we're just about, you know, we got about 10 minutes left. Well, we can always end a little early, but, um, so just to kind of review, right? So, um, so we've looked at analogical reasoning in detail, which is a special form of reasoning. And we've seen how it uses abduct, we've learned all, we learned a new word, abduction. And we've looked at induction, abduction, and deduction in the context of analogy. I think this disqualifying point is a really good one. Um, and um, I also think this idea is analogies giving us insight into causal relationships is an interesting one, too, because if you think about the lion gets away, right, the relationship is danger or causing harm, and so we, we look at that. I'm, trying, I'm going to try to think of analogies that might involve other than causal relationships. There can certainly be analogies about the quality of something, the mm. essence of something, that, like it has to tie up to causation, but that's a really interesting idea. And then I hope that the cataloging of reasons and types of reasons is useful, because as a list, you can certainly you know, review it and think about it as you're coming up with and evaluating arguments in support of or against a motion. You can think of all the different ways, right? Practically, administer, you can just be like, that's not, you know, or they can integrate themselves into points of information, right? So you can just be like, madam, how is that going to be you know, administratable? Or is that really the best institution? Or does that conform with our accepted moral norms of you know, the freedom and independence of people? And so I think they make, they make good, like, kind of just pot shots for points of information, but they're also good ways that you can think about really, you know, rigidly thinking about how does my reason giving, you know, what types of reasons. And then there's a whole debate about whether or not you can only give moral reasons for moral propositions, right? The is ought fallacy, that, that, that describing the way, you know, telling me facts about the way the world is, is irrelevant to a a moral debate, or vice versa, telling me that that's not the way it should be is irrelevant to a fact debate. So can you ever validly give moral reasons in a fact debate, right? Or, or do, do moral reasons only have to go towards moral propositions or moral conclusions? And so these are interesting questions that obviously are, are interesting to think about.
And then finally, just the idea of the four criterion of a good argument and how fallacies might relate to the sufficiency of those criteria. So I think, you know, I know it's a little disjointed and I'm talking about three kind of totally unrelated areas, but uh, they're all things that I, I recently, you know, come across and become interested in. So any questions? From what I hear, adduction is very closely related to the idea of the scientific method where you want to emphasize. And basically, that's, I think just come, came out in a new word just to encapsulate um, hypothesis and then put it into some book to, to make it a book. It's the same stuff like that. Uh, before, you, before you actually do something, you would think of the possible stuff, then you would test it up, right? Induction, and then you reason it up all the other way around. The it's about the same stuff. It is, it is, you're right. The science, so, so you're right. So we can draw an analogy between the scientific method and reasoning by analogy itself. Yes. Yeah, yes. abduction is classically, I know, in theory of science, that's what they talk about in theory of science, is how abduction is the way that hypotheses are generated. But you still can't get over the fact that there's no objective way to generate your hypotheses. Those still come from uh, intuition. And, and the idea is if you're trained, you have better intuition. The, the, other, the other thing I'm very curious about is how, how do people uh, like uh, businessmen on the Korea arrive at some kind of product, for example, uh, not Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates, how do you arrive at the desk software or, or Apple coming up with iPod? So I think that would be an interesting way of looking at like, uh, um, there's nothing to do with debate, but they obviously apply some kind of reasoning to it that we call intuition De Bono, I think Edwin De Bono and his work on creativity, I know he's very interested in these ideas of kind of random entry, so you just kind of, you know, um, open up the dictionary, pull out a random word, and then just see where that, you know, or, or like what if, like I think, what if a car was like chocolate, or he, there was an example of how shock absorbers were invented, oh, what if cars had square wheels, right, you just think of it as an absurd example, if I had to have a car with square wheels, well, you'd want to lift the car up, right, to make it go, right, because you have these square wheels, and so the idea is like, if my car had square wheels, I would need to lift suspension up and have a shock absorber, and so the idea, so that's actually how the idea of a shock absorber got developed, was through this idea of hypothesizing that if a car had square wheels, how would it go, and how would you want to make it function, yeah. Uh, I think there's an interesting theory on creativity, and it's that we all accept information from our environment, which is more than 90% filtered through our unconscious processing. So the people that are creative just have the fortune to tap into the right information at the right moment. So we would be able to produce more creativity if we would find a way how to find that information that we usually don't have access to. Because this, that theory states creativity is not inventing something new. It's just making a link between two things you already saw. It's just that not enough people tap into all of... We don't process the same information when we look at a thing consciously. Mm -hmm. So the person that gets lucky to process the right link consciously gets creative. That's, yeah, that's like the blink theory, like where you have a, a problem where it was like, uh, like there's a, it's a question of like, how do you get these two things to touch without moving either of them or something like that? And the, the trick was apparently you had to swing the rope. That, that was the solution. And so they put someone in this room, they're like, all right, figure it out. And then um, then they had someone else come in and brush by the rope. And then people, when they saw that happened, figured out the solution. Much quicker. But, had, but never used seeing that as the reason why they did. And I guess it's this idea of how much of this is just the, the conscious brain taking credit for the unconscious brain. Yeah. So I know that, yeah, so the creativity research, I think, of De Bono is very interesting because he's very critical of what he calls the gang of three, right? Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. He thinks that that set back Western civilization thousands of years because we can't get out of the, this idea of constant rational mindset and that it's very counterproductive to creativity. And he has a lot of devices like the use of the word Poe. And so you just say, like, how would Poe cars, right? And you just you try to get out of these random entry where you just pull a word out of the dictionary and say, so. But that's basically doing this, trying to find, trying to draw a random word out and see if it produces a link. 
right. or subconscious yeah. processing if we find uh, uh, an idea that comes out of it. Yes, If exactly. we find an association with it. And that's going to be in my next lecture, right, on the Bob Dylan songs, because this is what, I'm gonna, you know, this is 12 arguments and the Bob Dylan songs that inspired them. It's just like they're... they're the other yeah. thing I like to say is that sometimes, because I've been debate for so long, sometimes I have this anti-reasoning feeling that, that reasoning tend to be conservative, reasoning tend to be uh, centralist and establishment-based. You, you never get up. If once you, you like think through everything, you never become creative. Like yeah. One reason why I think Obama won was because his message was call you to ask for you to take a leap of faith in the change, and he doesn't tell you what the change is. So, so you may not you may not be logical, but maybe maybe you want the idea that change is possible, right? So. Reasoning may not always be a thing to do with debate. Sometimes it's to call, to buy something that is a hope in the future. Yeah, that's, that's a good note. And a good note to leave it on, hopeful future. Yes. So, anyway. Change the world. Change the world. Yeah. Okay.